you can see why, at least for a little while longer, it matters that we do things like this. It matters that we still get the people together co-located in physical space to facilitate social learning that as yet may not be quite within reach in the virtual space. But who knows, in a few years, maybe we'll do the whole thing in there, but hopefully the technology will be a little bit more ready for us when we get there. So how are you all doing? Are you all right? Yeah, you're gonna put your phones away now? Yeah? Okay, good, because I have a very short time now to cover a pretty big orientation to thinking about the future and to understanding what it really means to think exponentially rather than linearly. Okay, so this is gonna be quick. There's gonna be a lot to it, but uh, we're gonna do it in this room rather than VR. So are you ready? Okay, you didn't sound like it. Are you, are you actually ready? Or do you want me to go back to VR? <laughs> okay, good, now you're with me. Okay, so let's talk about the future, friends. The first thing to know about the future, and this is the best thing about it in many ways, it is unwritten. It is very much what you make of it. And when I say you, I literally mean you in this room because you are people of certain influence, power, position that you actually can meaningfully impact the course of human events. So that's the first thing to know. You have a role in this. The second thing to know about the future is that each successive tomorrow will be more radically different from its respective yesterday than was the tomorrow before it. That's what it means to live in a time of accelerating change. Today is not like yesterday, and tomorrow will not be like today. But to better understand the tomorrow that we are building, and to be able to really design and create the tomorrow that we want to see, it helps to understand how all of our yesterdays got us to today. And it also then, I believe, helps to start at the beginning. And in the beginning, there was the law of accelerating returns, first articulated by Singularity University co-founder Ray Kurzweil. And this is a law of systems, a law as old as life itself. You may recognize this animation uh, from Carl Sagan's Cosmos about 30 years ago, quickly dramatizing the course of evolution, of life on Earth. Now obviously this is sped way up, right? Can't do this in real time or we would be here for eons. This also is not one-to-one, -one. this is not to scale, right? My point here is that were we to actually play this out to scale, it would take a very, very, very long time, billions of years, to get from kind of primordial muck to microorganisms. But once you get there, getting from microorganisms to a really cool giant lizard doesn't actually take as long. And then from there, to humans who can use tools, takes even shorter still. And we can see that the selective pressure of evolution applies a positive feedback loop and that the more capable methods at each stage are used to create the following stage. And so what this means is that the progress of an evolutionary process actually increases exponentially over time. So it required billions of years for the first steps, but later on progress accelerates. And Ray Kurzweil actually noted that exponential growth is a feature of any evolutionary process, of which technology is a primary example. And key to this, the emergence of the first technology-creating species, that came from the evolutionary process of biology. And so you have technological evolution as an outgrowth of, and a continuation of, biological evolution. And so if technology develops in an evolutionary system, thinking as we do with biology, this means that if you have a new process, a development or a tool that proves adaptive in some way, you have a proof of concept, this thing works, it can be done and it is better, that thing will then be propagated forward through additional research and development and iteration. And we have greater resources deployed towards the further progress of that thing, of that process. And that results in a second level of exponential growth. So that the rate of exponential growth is itself growing exponentially. And we can see this if we look at the history of technology. Now, I should say, this graph is obviously reductive. It is missing lots and lots of technological milestones, but I hope there's enough here to make the point. 
Ray put this together. And so what you have on one axis is population. On the other, you have time. And in that scatter plot is technological milestones. And again, notice it took a really long time for us to get to mathematics and physics. But once we have those, a lot of the pieces that follow on, those start to come at a faster and faster rate. And as we see population increasing steeply on the extreme right-hand side of the graph, so does the concentration of technological breakthroughs. This means that the rate of discovery, of innovation, of solution architecture itself is increasing exponentially. Now, there are a couple things that you can see that you can read from this. One is that sustaining systems that have grown larger and more complex requires more innovation to be able to support that population. The other thing is that as we have grown the community of solvers, as we've had more people with more tools, that actually is fueling innovation as well. And together, I think these suggest the power of ideas and the increasing pace of innovation as an emergent property of the interconnected feedback loops in our complex sociocultural systems. And this also suggests that in a world that is now digital, networked at the global level and exponential, we're gonna be confronted with new challenges and new opportunities, one after another. And they're gonna come quickly, such that today's crazy pace of change, and I imagine probably if you do feel like the pace is a little bit crazy right now, this is the slowest that you're ever likely to experience. Which means it's more important than ever to be able to think further ahead, to be able to practice what Buckminster Fuller called anticipatory design. And to do that means taking the long view. But taking the long view is hard, especially when it means leaving behind linear thinking. The idea that you can predict future performance from past results. The idea that tomorrow the sun will come up and it will shine down on a day more or less like today and yesterday and your parents yesterday, right? That's what we evolved to do really well. Taking that long view, thinking exponentially, is something that we are not good at. In fact, uh, Roy Amara, who is the president of the Institute for the Future, articulated something that's called Amara's Law. And the thing to know about Amara's Law is that this is not a law like in laws of physics or even the law of accelerating returns about evolutionary systems. This is just a really keen observation of human behavior, right? And Amara said that we tend to overestimate the effect of a technology in the short run and underestimate the effect in the long run. My colleague, the futurist Michelle Zappa, pointed out to me recently that this is weird because even when we know it's true, it's still true, right? We're stuck in this. And consider, if you will, the iPhone, right? This is one where you probably remember the first one you got, right? Your first smartphone. And if you're anything like me, you probably thought it was gonna change everything. It was gonna change your life. It was gonna make you an infinitely more productive person, right? You remember that? That moment when you thought it was really gonna make you more productive in everything? Uh, you probably didn't think that in the long term, these smartphones might play a critical role in bending the course of global economics, culture, and politics, right? We underestimated the long term. We didn't see what this thing was gonna become. But maybe we should have, because this is actually the exponential that we know the best. This should be the easy one. How many of you have heard of Moore's Law? Give me a hand if you have. Yes, how many of you feel like you could explain it in front of 1,900 people? Keep your hands up. <laughs> Tanya, thank you. I'm not gonna pull anyone up here. I'm just gonna say in brief, it's this idea that Gordon Moore articulated uh, some 50 or 60 years ago that roughly every two years, every 18 months or so, we see a doubling in the price performance of computation. Right? To illustrate that, we have here, up on the slide, uh, on the right, the Cray-1 supercomputer, circa 1976, the best in the world. Cost about $33 million US. Was the fastest computer in the world for about five years. On the left here, you have the humble iPhone 5S, several generations back. Probably not many of you are even carrying that anymore. I could buy one of these today on eBay for probably about $120, right? Now, because you're here and because you're you, you probably have a sense which of these is the more capable computational device, but you might not know by just how much. 
right? It's become almost a cliche in Silicon Valley to say that you're sitting on or you're playing with more computing power than NASA had when they put two men on the moon in the 1960s, right? Some of you might be or you might know someone who dropped the collective computing power of NASA in the toilet at a nightclub on a Friday. <laughs> yeah, it could be you all who are laughing. And it is funny, but the thing that's less funny and the thing that we should ask ourselves is what does it mean to have all of this power in your pocket and to know that everyone else has it and that they're all networked and that they're changing the world? What are you doing with it? And then also to know that it's not just Moore's Law. Moore's Law is actually what Ray Kurzweil called the fifth paradigm of this long-term trend that's gone on for 110 years as a series of nested S-curves where we've seen this exponential increase in the price performance of computation. And even if the fifth paradigm might be stalling out, there's probably going to be a sixth paradigm. We can already see the beginnings of it in advances in nanotechnology and in quantum computing. So this is the thing that's going, and it's going to go forward. And it's not just what we're doing with our computing devices. It's what we're able to build through processes of recombinant innovation on top of this, this platform, this abundant wave of computational power. All of these technologies, and these are just a few that you're going to be hearing about this week, all of these technologies are riding Moore's Law. They're riding that wave. And so their development, too, will continue to accelerate and feed the development of new exponential technologies. And those technologies will also be developing at at least an exponential rate, which means that we're expanding the scope of the possible day by day, like literally day by day. And we're changing the way that we understand ourselves, our future, and our world. And we're entering a world now where we'll be able to leverage intelligence and even creativity beyond the human, to design the future. We're entering a world where we're going to have to really think about what it means to be good trainers and even role models for our artificially intelligent and robotic children. And we're getting to that world much more quickly than most of us realize, more quickly than most of us are comfortable with. I mean, remember, it wasn't actually all that long ago that we were here. Right? This was the 1980s, this distinctly unsexy technological artifact. You remember this thing, a few of you? It's okay, I do too, yeah. <laughs> and yet now, here we are in this room, all sitting on something greater than the collective computing power needed to coordinate a moon landing. So what happened? Well, we began to digitize everything. So a nice dramatization of this from the folks at uh, the Harvard Innovation Lab. Before your very eyes, the, the desktop of the past that you knew and loved is vanishing. Digitization was and remains the key. That video stops in 2014, but it gets us pretty close to today. But I don't know about you all, but today I, I do have the smartphone and I have the laptop, but weirdly I actually probably make more calls on my laptop, work calls where I'm on video, and I do a lot of my computing when I'm walking around on my phone, which is strange. But I want to ask all of you, as empowered exponential thinkers, what happens next if I kept running this video into the present and future? Where do we go from there, from that smartphone and that laptop? What's next? That's a real question. If, if you're looking at your Apple Watch on your wrist, one, I hope you're not checking the time, but two, you're not thinking far enough ahead. What happens next? Where might we go? Huh? We have wearables. Yeah, we, we're already there. What happens next? Into the body. Yeah, I see a couple of you starting to point at your head. <laughs> yeah, Elon Musk thinks he knows. You might have heard of Neuralink, right? And it's not just Elon, DARPA, the people who brought you the internet. Um, put about $65 million of research funding into this last year, uh, where these folks are imagining a truly interconnected networked world that's not just a smart fridge or a smart thermostat, but a world that you can interact with seamlessly that appears to learn in real time and respond to you. Now, we could probably spend all day debating whether or not this is a future that we want, 
but I would posit that we also may need to augment human sense-making capability sooner than we think because the world is growing in complexity. This is a video from the Grail Lab at the University of Washington where they trained a neural network on video footage of Barack Obama and then they generated new footage with audio supplied of him speaking. Have a look and tell me if you know which one of these to is help real. families refinance their homes, to invest in things like high-tech manufacturing, clean energy, and the infrastructure that creates good new jobs. Not to mention the job training that helps folks earn new skills to fill those jobs. The results are clear. The results are clear, are they? I'll tell you what, sometimes I really miss this guy and being able to generate four of him is exciting. <laughs> but I ask you this, friends, which one of these is the real footage? Bottom left, that's a good answer. I heard bottom right over here. Bottom right, bottom right. And we have some consensus building up here in the front. Well, these are all really good answers because they're all wrong. <laughs> None of these are the original video footage. That is, that is original audio, although now we can easily synthesize audio like this as well. But all of the video was created by an artificial intelligence system. And if you're looking at this, and you're thinking, holy wow, <laughs> we may be in for a real epistemological crisis where we no longer know what we know and how we know it, and maybe we can't agree on what is real or what is true. Maybe you're starting to think, we may be screwed. We may have innovated ourselves into a real problem here because this technology, this is not just in the university labs. This came out uh, summer of 2017 online, and within a few months, we started seeing apps very similar to this that you could pick up off of the nether world of Reddit and you could create the deep fake videos and swap faces and create new things. And this is a little bit alarming. Now, that said, being as innovative as we are, solutions to this, possible solutions, might already be emerging. A German researcher named Andreas Rosler uh, had created another <laughs> another deep learning neural network, an algorithmic tool that could spot fake video better than any human could do it. And it was trained to identify these fakes and flag them for us. And there are other researchers and other organizations that are building those kinds of tools to help us support truth and knowledge. But I don't know about you, but I'm not thrilled about the idea of forever being in this game of cat and mouse where we have to engineer our way out of problems that we engineered our way into in the first place. That's a little bit alarming to me. So I think the other possibility, rather than just relying on our innovative capacity, which is immense, is that we can start to think a little bit more deeply, a little bit more rigorously about the design choices that we have in building the future. And we can recognize that we're building that future in non-neutral feedback loops. We can embrace the responsibility implicit in the idea that we're designing the tools that will design us. That's heavy. <laughs> um, this is one of my heroes, Donna Haraway, who is uh, an anthropologist and futurist at UC Santa Cruz. And, and she wrote, among other great things, uh, that technology is not neutral. We're inside of what we make and it's inside of us. We're living in a world of connections and it matters which ones get made and unmade. This is pulling Melvin Kranzberg and Marshall McLuhan and the Toronto School into the idea that we really need to think deeply about what we're building because we are building our future selves, right? This is a feedback loop. This is a very complex system. Now, implications matter. So how do we get better at spotting them and thinking through them? Well, perhaps looking back at some of the technological artifacts of our recent past, Maybe that can help us better understand our future, to understand what these will become, what we will become. And we've seen enough technological disruption now that we can start to use frameworks and real heuristics to capture some of these dynamics. One that I like that you'll be hearing a lot about in the next two days is Peter Diamandis' idea of the six Ds of exponential technology and disruption, where things really kick off with digitization, and we've been able to digitize all sorts of things for a while. Not just photos, media, text, but DNA, right? That's information. We can make that code. If it's code, we can, we can reprogram, we can hack things. 
Right now, when we have conversations about building blockchains, what we're thinking about there is digitizing trust relationships, right? Validation and authentication. So this is still going on. We're still finding new things to digitize. And once we digitize something, we can manipulate it in new ways. And it exists as information. And it can be built on and built with as an information-enabled technology. And that puts us on this curve here where we tend to go through a long, sometimes, deceptive phase, where it doesn't really seem like we're working towards anything that's market viable. Yeah, sure, we know we can do it, but it's so far away from producing a real solution or a market alternative or something that would be scalable that it's just kind of disappointing. It's like, yeah, that sounds great. We, we could 3D print 40 years ago, but a 3D printer took up half of a room and it could make like a plastic Yoda head. That did not seem disruptive. Right? It costs a quarter million dollars to have the device, but all of these things are moving, and if we're not watching them, then we're surprised when that thing crosses a threshold, the good enough line where it becomes market viable, and then it becomes not just a substitute or an alternative, but something that is so much better and so different that it entirely changes the market. It entirely changes the way we live and the way we think about these things. And then what does disruption look like? Well, we know it looks like dematerialization. Right? Things go away. You saw that nicely with that video of the desktop. It looks like demonetization. Established business models or players in the industry, they're no longer relevant. And it looks like it happens overnight if we're not watching. And democratization, where the tools that were developed in the research lab or developed over a decade with government funding, now they're in your hand. Right now they're out there in the world. That could be scary, it can also be very empowering. I mentioned earlier the idea of growing the community of solvers. This is something I believe in deeply. That as we are getting powerful new technologies into the hands of more people in more places, we can come up with better solutions. We can also better understand the problems by empowering the people who are closest to them as solvers. Now, to illustrate this a little further, I wanna introduce the cost of DNA sequencing. Have any of you had your genome sequenced? Has anybody done that here? Yeah, I'll raise my hand, so don't feel weird if you have. Okay, a few of you. A lot of you who are affiliated with Singularity University, I notice. Uh, okay, I would love to get you all together again in five years and ask that question, see how the room has changed, and maybe ask also how many of you think it might have happened without you knowing. Because here is where we've been, and I'll tell you a bit about where we're going. In 1997, the first time we were able to sequence a full human genome, it took more than a decade and it cost almost $3 billion. The endeavor of a nation state, right? This was hard to do, really hard to do. Um, less than 10 years later, we'd lopped off a bunch of those zeros. This was when Gordon Moore of Moore's Law actually had his genome sequenced. $350,000, getting to the point where we can imagine maybe some things being built with this. It doesn't take a government to get it done. Now, if this were a linear progression, and you start at three billion, we could have improved this by $25 million a year, it sounds like a nice savings, and it would have taken more than a century to get to that point. Instead, it took nine years. That's the power of exponentials. I could show you an even steeper curve if we did gene editing, which we'll be hearing more about from my colleague Tiffany Bora later this week. Uh, so from there, we go to 2014, we get down to the $1,000 genome. This really starts to look like a thing that we can get out into the world and do stuff with. And then just last year, Illumina Systems, down the street from Singularity, started shipping the machines that could get us the $100 genome, right? And they could do it three times as fast, and the machine costs less than a million dollars. Now, where do we go from here, exponential thinkers? What happens next? Does it stay at $100? Probably not. Uh, our chair of biotechnology, Raymond McCauley, likes to say that in a few years, it's going to be the cost of getting a pizza delivered. And then a few years after that, it's going to be the cost of flushing a toilet. And at that point, your toilet may be sequencing your genome regularly. <laughs> that has implications. A lot to think about there. And we can already see this at work. Um, this is the handheld min-ion sequencer from Oxford Nanopore Technologies. This is already out in the world, right? It's a handheld device. It's faster. It's cheaper. It's not in the lab. This is working towards creating an abundance of genetic information. 
And what can we build with an abundance of genetic information if we really understand the code of life itself and we can hack it and reprogram it? Well, here's an example. A company called Modern Meadow that has hacked yeast to crank out biofabricated synthetic leather, which means you're basically decoupling animal products from the animal and the environment, right? You can really change the way that people live and consume and our impact on the planet by leveraging these types of technologies. This is agriculture and industry reimagined at the cellular level. And we're not just re-engineering yeast, right? We're hacking the genetic code of humans as well. These are bio-printed heart cells, right? We can make little organoids. It's kind of like a model of a, a larger heart, right? This is a cluster of heart cells that could match anyone's DNA. It could match mine. It could match yours. And we can take something like this, these organoids, and we can put them on a microfluidic chip, and we can create a whole array of these. It's not that hard for them to do anymore. And we can combine computing and genomics and big data and AI and machine learning, and we can test all sorts of compounds and drugs on this organoid, and we have a much closer match than any clinical, could, clinical trial could ever produce for how it will work for you, right? This means a lot for personalized medicine and for drug development, and if we extrapolate from this a little bit further, when we can start to think about creating things for specific humans at the molecular level, we might be able to start thinking about what it means to be human. We might be able to start thinking about this unique moment in the history of life where we can make choices about how we want to evolve as a species. That's a big responsibility too. That's a big moment. And my point here is that with all of these technologies, we've been moving out of this deceptive growth phase and we are entering into an era of amazement and chaos. A time when we're gonna have to make some real choices about who we will be and what we will do. Rob Nail talked about this a minute ago at Singularity University and welcome all of you to the community. We're working to minimize the chaos and maximize the amazement, right? That's what we wanna do at the end of the day. And I wanna talk about using these technologies to debug the system that we have created over eons of time in our world. We live in a world of tremendous beauty and inspiration, but uh, ours is a world with no shortage of problems urgently in need of solution. Here's one. I mentioned to you all I was in Portugal last week. Um, the day before we ran a program kind of like this, there was a big wildfire not far from the venue. Portugal, like my home in California, had its worst year of wildfires on record in 2017. Those are not going to get better, right? This is a big problem. But there may be some interesting things that we can do with some of our technological tools to get better at mitigating this problem. Uh, possibly part of the solution. 3D mapping with drone LiDAR, right? This is combinatorial innovation again, where we take things that we already have and then we build new tools with them. This is using computer vision, 3D mapping, uh, like you've seen in driverless cars with the LiDAR system algorithmic forecasting that we can feed all of this data and these maps into to better understand how fires spread, to better understand the risks, and to better coordinate the response on really difficult and complicated terrain. There's a company in California called Flight Evolved that's working on this right now, and they're looking at huge efficiency gains over old methods of mapping where you'd have a, a surveyor doing one image at a time rather than LIDAR sending out a million laser pulses. This is technology that could save billions of dollars and thousands of lives. And it's using tools that, again, are only recently becoming available to lots of people, lots of solvers who are close to problems that really matter. Linus Torvald, who is the founder of Linux, articulated what's known as Torvald's Law, and he was talking about open source software. But I think it applies to the world and problem solving in general. He said, given enough eyeballs, all bugs are shallow. If you have enough people working on a problem, you will come up with a lot of solutions, and one of those will be the right solution, right? This is why I'm so excited about exponential technologies democratizing, getting out into the world, and thinking about all the problems that we particularly want to solve in our organizations, in our communities, in our countries, in our world, right? You all heard last year from my colleague, Ramez Nam, and he's here again this week, and he told you all about the declining cost of solar energy, 
right? This is, again, something we've been able to do for a long time, but it didn't seem market viable. Um, but the cost has dropped as the technology has become more sophisticated. It's attracted more funding. It's become easier to do, easier to use. And in 2017, which I don't have up here, we reached the point where we could produce a solar cell thinner than a human hair that could sit on a soap bubble without popping it. I'm not going to tell you about what this means for the future of energy. Instead, I want to talk about what it means for the future of problem solving. Because all these big challenges are related. And if you solve some of the energy problem by getting solar out into the world, making it accessible at the household or family scale, you can start to do some really interesting things. This is the team from Magic Water, an international team of entrepreneurs leveraging family scale solar and hydrophilic materials to capture water from the air. So if you have air and you have energy from the sun, you can have safe, clean drinking water. And they designed this, they took on this project to address worsening drought conditions in Kenya. That's where they're launching their first products and they're planning to spread from there. Um, last summer, they had this proof of concept prototype. It doesn't look very high tech because what they did is just hack together existing technology and created a system that could generate 10 liters of water per day from the air using solar technology. And their mission, their plan, is to be able to produce clean water at less than one cent per liter. And they're gonna have bundled finance. This works off grid, obviously. And basically, they're using the available tools in a growing tool set to render something scarce, abundant. This is transformative. I bet most of you had not seen this, and none of these women are famous yet. And that's kind of the point. This is not just the province of Amazon and Google and, again, university labs. These are tools in your tool set as entrepreneurs, as innovators, as problem solvers. And how you think about that role makes all the difference in the world. Because mindsets matter. And I want to close on this, on an idea of mindsets and becoming. There's a, a pioneering cognitive and learning psychologist at Stanford University named Carol Dweck, who wrote a book called Mindset uh, about 12 years ago, I think, where she laid out this differentiation between the fixed mindset versus the growth mindset. The fixed mindset, these are people who believe that ability and intelligence are innate, right? That we are who we are. I can't learn to code, I'm not good at math, uh, I don't dance, you know, those kinds of things. On the other hand, the growth mindset, these are the individuals who believe that ability and intelligence can be developed, right? That we can become who we want to be and that we will embrace that process of development and growth. And guess what? The growth mindset correlates not only more strongly with success in acquiring new skills and solving problems as a child, which is what Dr. Dweck started focusing on, this goes through life. The growth mindset correlates strongly with more successful outcomes over the course of life itself, right? People grow because they believe they can, that they, they then become who and what they need and want to be. And Carol Dweck wrote that the fixed mindset does not allow people the luxury of becoming. They already have to be. They are what they are. We can do what we can do, and that is that. And I would argue that in a world of accelerating change, a world that is always in the process of becoming something new, then we too have to become something new. That we have to become exponential thinkers and problem solvers and empowered agents of change, working together to build the network that South Africa needs and that our world needs. And I believe that we can start today by thinking differently and questioning our assumptions about the future. We can start by uh, what the management theorist and futurist Christian Cruz called killing the official future. Whoever you are, whatever organization you work for, you have some idea of what the world is gonna be like and you are always executing against that. And if you're the founder of an organization, you probably came up with an idea of the future. If you're an employee, you might have inherited an official future. It might have been sitting on the shelf for a very long time before you even got there. And we have to wonder, is that thing responsive to an evolving context? Maybe now is the time to take it down, to interrogate it, to bring more people into the conversation and to question our assumptions. And in killing the future, we have the opportunity to embrace the possible future, right? 
And I am thrilled to be exploring possible futures with all of you this week. And to be your host, connecting these dots, these ideas, the people who are going to frame new possibilities as we expand the scope of our conversation. And for the next while, we're gonna develop the themes of thinking and doing differently, both at the personal level and at the level of the systems that we create. Thank you.